is an intriguingly titled company, which I'm sure we'll find out more about as we delve into the uh, discussion. Um, but just to uh, frame the topic uh, for us, biodiversity um, is something which uh, uh, perhaps we know of, we're not quite sure what it means, um, but we probably hear that it's in trouble. Um, that's about as much as I think as people kind of gain from that topic if they go about their daily business. The sixth great extinction sounds, though, rather dramatic. Um, and uh, what is that about? Well, in the last half billion years or so of life on Earth, um, we've been life t in total has um, been nearly wiped out five times. Um, there's been climate change, there's been intense ice ages, there's been volcanoes, there was that massive meteor um, that struck Mexico about 65 million years ago, wiped out the dinosaurs, about five times, and we've had a real challenge um, of life on Earth. The intriguing thing is that um, those who are studying the science of what is going on on the planet are suggesting that we might be facing the sixth great extinction right now um, in our lifetimes. There's some absolutely stunning analysis that came out during 2016 from WWF, which has provoked um, much of this debate, um, which we're delighted to hear a little bit more about from Marco, and then we'll take some other perspectives from uh, our other colleagues on the panel, and then perhaps if there's time and interest, we'll open up for some questions. So if I can start with you, Marco Lambertini of WWF, um, what have you found out, and why should we be so worried? So first, thank you, Dominic. First of all, um, we definitely can say we are entering, we have entered um, something similar to one of the mass extinctions uh, of the previous uh, 100 million years. Uh, the science is telling us that the rate of extinction today is about 100 to 1,000 times higher than natural rates. Uh, species are extinguishing very quickly. And the interesting, uh, depressing, tragic, scary dimension is that we don't even know many of the species that go extinct because they go extinct even before they're described by science. Um, that particularly driven by tropical uh, forest uh, um, disappearance. So um, that's one dimension, extinction of species, and we are facing clearly a mass uh, wave of extinction. Second dimension, which is less talked about and is about our report, um, uh, Living Planet report launched in September, is about the actual decline in populations of wildlife numbers of actual animals and plants. And uh, the uh, assessment that we did across the world um, uh, is about, uh, it po points uh, at, at the decline of wildlife populations of 60% in the last 40 years, less than a generation and blink of an eye compared to the history of life on Earth. Uh, and it predicted at this rate of, of decline, it predicted two third a decline by 2020. At the same time, when a global convention, the Convention of Biological Diversity, um, as a 2020 target to halt uh, extinction and, and reverse the trend uh, of the loss of biodiversity. Clearly, we are not on the right track. Uh, clearly, we are facing a big challenge. Uh, and, um, and the importance of this is twofold. One is because biodiversity is a difficult term, a bit gray and perhaps too technical. It means life. It means diversity of life. And it means uh, that we have clearly a moral obligation to preserve life on Earth that has evolved along guys, alongside us. But the second dimension is that biodiversity is not just something beautiful, inspirational, nice, morally, um, we're morally obliged to conserve, but it's actually the foundation of the function of, eco of ecosystems. When you look at a forest, it's not a patch of green. It's actually a multitude of species, millions and millions of individuals, of plants and animals, interacting and making the forest a living ecosystem and a productive ecosystem. And if you're losing biodiversity and species are a little bit the bricks of the wall of life. If you imagine the, the life on Earth, the diversity of life on Earth as a beautiful huge wall made of so many species, about a, a million and a half described, perhaps up to 10 million. Um, and if you begin to take bricks away from the wall, species by species, the whole world will collapse. And some species, perhaps even more important than others, uh, in their role. And so our message is um, extinction is uh, um, rampant, decline is equally, uh, or populations, um, numbers of animals is equally concerning. And this is something that is important morally, uh, is a moral imperative for us, but equally is a business imperative because we are wrecking uh, um, uh, Nature uh, Inc., uh, the um, um, enterprise that actually 
uh, defines lives on Earth and supports our well-being and economy too. Marco, thank you. So just to pause on that, and um, you're probably used to these um, incredible statistics because this is the area that you work in and lead so successfully all the time. But if we hear this correctly, you're saying that between 1970 and 2012, so it's that 42 years, um, close to 60% of all wild animals that have a backbone, a vertebrae, went. Yeah, I mean, this is based on very thorough studies on the field, field studies, across about uh, 3,000, I think, if I remember correctly, samples around the world, all over the world, tropics, non-tropics, etc. And they've been monitoring populations, and populations have been crashing. But that's incredible. It is incredible, <laughs> and it is very scary. And it is equally worrying than the extinction rate, um, because this is, these are the individuals, as I said before, are actually supporting the functioning of ecosystems. And in your perspective, when there was this large meeting in Hawaii that the IUCN, um, the conservation organization, held uh, in September, I think, of, of, of 2016. Uh, in, in your um, uh, perspective, what is stopping um, the world community or others not just being aghast by that statistic? It, I, I don't think... Many people would know that. It's no, I think, uh, I think many people know, and, and we are receiving uh, a lot of support. I mean, the Living Plant Report was, a mass, was, was actually covered uh, uh, globally by media, locally and globally in a huge way, and people are really concerned about that. However, the problem is that while we are able, for example, take climate change, we're, able, we're finally able to make a compelling case for uh, a, a, a determined action against, against climate change because it's obvious that climate change is impacting our life, our businesses. The cost is beginning to be material and, and evident. On biodiversity, something a little bit, a step more uh, distant. So we don't still yet completely feel the impact of the loss of biodiversity. And I think that doesn't help us to respond as fiercely as we are beginning to respond to climate change. And, you know, climate change on one hand and loss of nature, biodiversity in natural places, are the two sides, I think, of the huge ecological, ecological crisis of our time. They are equally important, they are connected, and we should pay attention to both. In 42 years, close to 60% of all the wild animals who have a vertebrae, a backbone, on the planet went. Uh, if that's not a kind of um, meme or something that should go viral from um, this uh, annual meeting on the back of all the great work of the One Planet Report, I don't know what should. Um, when you look at geological time and the billions and millions of years, we're talking in 42 years. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, the reason is that a lot of, there was a beautiful article, I think it was The Guardian, the title was Another Frog gone extinct in Central America. The press, or the business, I don't remember, yawns. <laughs> Meaning, you know, people you know, appreciate the tragedy and the importance of what that means in the longer term, actually in the medium term for us. And yeah. that's the problem. Psychologically, the link is still not there. A lot of people are outraged mostly on ethical and, and, and conservation reasons. The business case for biodiversity to be preserved is still not there. Um, we'll come on to um, uh, Ada and Patrick in a second, but um, just to pursue this, you were just saying outside, I think actually, Pat, you mentioned this as well. Um, for those who perhaps are not as close to these statistics, it was quite important to use the world word wild animals um, in that because that sounds like something else is happening. Um, it's not like we're losing loads of cows and sheep. or <laughs> Quite the opposite. So what's happening um, with... Well, in fact, you know, I don't, I don't think how, how I don't know how accurate it is, but I came across recently a calculation that was uh, tried to estimate the biomass of vertebrates, wildlife, uh, versus uh, domesticated animals and people. And we are reaching a point uh, uh, where the weight of uh, people and cattle and chicken and pork and everything else uh, we domesticated is far far bigger than the combined weight, biomass, of wild animals. So we are uh, anthropomorphizing, whatever the word is, <laughs> our planet with, uh, with a strong imprint, a footprint on, uh, in terms of uh, altering natural systems. And I suppose by your explanation at the beginning, the whole point of biodiversity is the diversity of all of these animals 
provides uh, resilience and multiple species and such, whereas if we just have lots and lots and lots of cows and sheep, that's, that's not very diverse. Well, who's going who to give us the fresh uh, water and the clean air and the food uh, from the sea? And uh, uh, you know, the ecosystems are providing services which are absolutely critical to life on Earth. We, let's remember the atmosphere was poisoned with CO2 uh, only uh, for uh, three billion years ago, well, a long time. Uh, but the plants and the forest uh, pumped oxygen yeah. into the atmosphere, and now it's livable for all of us and our, and our fellow species. So you know, this is serious stuff. I do have to say it again because when I read the report, I couldn't, I couldn't myself believe. It. I work in the space, so 1970 to 2012, 42 years, 60, 58, I think is the exact figure, but close to 60 percent of all the wild animals which have a vertebrae went on this planet. Um, Ada Greenbury, managing director of sustainability and stakeholder engagement of Asia Pulp and Paper. Your, your company's based in Indonesia. I guess there's two um, uh, kind of lines of questioning I'd be interested to explore with you. Number one is generally from um, your part of the world, ASEAN, you know, key emerging uh, group of economies, growing the world's uh, economy, the, the growth center. Do you sense that uh, uh, the topic of biodiversity and such is, is uh, you know, high on people's agenda, or is it quite rightly that we need to uh, consume resources to grow? Um, so that's the first question. And then secondly, within that context, uh, how does a, a company like yours um, find room to innovate and, and provide some sort of solution to this um, astonishing statistic? Thanks, Dominic. So um, my company, Asia Pulp and Paper Group, is one of the largest integrated forestry pulp and paper company in the world. Um, bef uh, in the past, we used to uh, use natural forest fiber to feed our pulp mills. And four years ago, um, uh, we uh, launched our zero deforestation policy, and we've been implementing it ever since uh, 2013. So, um, are, are this, is this agenda in, is in the people's mind? I think so, Dominic. So, because uh, uh, when we launch our zero deforestation zero deforestation policy, there are a lot of other companies who also follow our steps and also adopting similar policy. Innovation is one thing, but I would just want to share my experience that probably provide a glimpse of hope, Marco. Uh, my own experience, I don't read it from books, I've seen it in my own eyes. So um, in the past, when my company used to uh, um, process and cut natural forest fiber from the forest, I used to receive quite a lot of uh, reports about wildlife and human conflicts, namely between Sumatran tigers and human. And the moment we stop that bulldozer, the moment we stop that chainsaw in February 2013 until now, I never received any Sumatran tiger and human conflicts again in my life. And not only that, not only that, if you go visit our supplier's concession in South Sumatra, for example, you could see um, uh, our forest workers with uh, driving a car and then they stop and let tigers cross the, cross the road and then they go again, you know, uh, doing their, their job. So call me naive, but I really believe that wildlife and people can actually live side by side. So that's just a little bit of hope that I've seen with my own eyes. And but it, talking about biodiversity or the ecosystem, we're basically where this wildlife actually will thrive. It's, 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 it's quite um, uh, a challenge because even though uh, our company has been committed to zero deforestation for four years, but we saw that deforestation still happening in the tropics in Indonesia. So we have a look at what actually causes this deforestation, encroachment, forest fire, and everything else. And the core of it is actually about people. So in the last two years, uh, I've been trying to develop programs, innovative programs, to bring people, to embrace people, to, to help us uh, uh, save the biodiversity instead of destroying it. Uh, I believe that people can be part of solution, not just part of the problems in the sixth extinction or, or reverse the sixth extinction. So um, uh, the innovation that we've been trying to, 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 to develop is basically developing a community-based, landscape-based agroecology programs where we can actually increase the, uh, the income of the, of the people so they don't have to con continue encroaching the forest anymore. They can uh, have a, a weekly, a monthly, uh, yearly income 
and 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 also the the type of the uh, crops that they plant need to be designed in a way that it will also protect the environment, such as the peatland, for example. So it will protect the, uh, the the ecological values of of the areas that they're living in. So it's a win-win. Uh, we we can uh, uh, support the, the 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 communities to have a more sustainable livelihood agroecology program, and at the same time, this program will 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 see that uh, uh, it will help the the community not to further. Uh, uh, continue with the deforestation, but also have their agroecology programs protect the uh, environment. That's what the innovative approach that we're trying to do. Ada, thank you. And it um, has to be acknowledged that Asia Paper and Pulp have received many sort of accolades for the innovation um, in this space to both produce the resource that you want and it seems protect the environment at the same time. That that win-win. How difficult is that to do? I mean, I, I guess. It must be hard to be a leader in the space and say this is what we want to achieve or, or, or work with communities to do this. This can't be an easy task. No, company. it's very far away from easy. This is, I mean, we've been doing it for four years, so it's not as if we just uh, come up with a commitment yesterday or a year ago. So we've been actually for four years trying very hard to implement it. Um, um, and we're not trying to be leader. We're just trying to learn and how to improve our, our, our practice by, by implementing this zero deforestation policy, protecting biodiversity, uh, implementing landscape approach. Um, uh, the, the biggest challenges for us is still uh, um, um, making sure that the threats, the risk for the forest disappear or can be reduced. And to achieve that, there are a lot of innovative approach. We, you know, for the forest fire, for example, we, we uh, are implementing the latest technology for fire detection, for example. Uh, for the community, we, we, we come up with so many different uh, programs uh, for the community. But even designing programs for community is not that easy because we have to map communities. There are probably 1,000 villages across our supply chain. So we have to map them out. We have to define the typology of each village, uh, how many people are uh, living there, and then uh, and, and all the programs need to be based on participatory planning, not a program that we for, uh, force them to, to implement. So it's very, very hard work, uh, Dominic, and I really hope that the global community could help us deliver this. And if I may, I know one of your other big areas of interest is education. Um, and just you know, going back to that um, rather startling statistic that the uh, WWF had created in 2016, do you sense that more needs to be done on the kind of awareness raising or, or uh, education around the challenge that we face on, on, on biodiversity and the sort of impact on the environment of, of, of growth? In my part of the world, yes, education is important, but the more important is basically combating poverty because these people, this, this, this community who continue encroachment, continue with, with poaching, they just do it to try to uh, provide food uh, uh, on the table at the end of the day. So uh, fighting poverty is, is very important and in parallel we have to basically also provide education and technolo technology transfer to uh, enable them to come up with a more sustainable um, livelihood or earning. And then just a kind of final thought before um, uh, moving to uh, Patrick Brown. Uh, in the broader context, uh, do you feel that um, a government, I mean, you mentioned about the international community and looking for support. Do you, do you feel that uh, governments um, are also as concerned about this topic as, as, as you and other companies are? Yes, I mean, uh, with, the, with the current government right now, they've been, uh, um, uh, they have announced moratorium of natural forest conversion and, and, and expansion for palm oil. So they have tried very hard. They also um, uh, uh, announced the commitment to one map and everything else. But collaboration is, is key here because we cannot work in silo. So collaboration between private sector, civil society, and the government is very key to to, 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 to achieve what we want to achieve. I just want to emphasize that Indonesian forests do not just belong to Indonesia. Indonesian forests belong to the planet. So we all, all stakeholders globally, need to work together to, to achieve what we want to achieve in, in saving uh, the forests. Thank you. Mark, I might return to you a little bit later with some sort of thoughts on that, um, uh, to how far this is going to help solve the, the challenge that you set out. But Pat, Patrick Brown, if I can turn to you, the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of impossible foods. I know this is an area that's quite close to your heart and you're very interested in it, but 
very much interested in your thoughts um, on, on what you hear, because I know you're knowledge, very knowledgeable about this space. But also, I think we're all quite intrigued as to um, what Impossible Foods is um, and how that relates to this agenda, if, it, if at all it does. So, Pat. Uh, sure, yeah. I'm happy to answer that. Well, um, so uh, I, I think we're um, all right to be very concerned about um, the, uh, what Marco was reporting and this uh, um, threat to uh, wildlife on Earth. Um, and it's easy to just kind of get depressed about it. But if you, um, the approach is, let's understand what's causing it and then see if we can find a solution. And it turns out, and I'd be interested in Marco's view on this, but uh, um, I think he hinted at it, that by a huge margin, uh, the driver of the meltdown in wildlife populations uh, and biodiversity losses and uh, um, species extinction is the use of animals in the food system, animal agriculture and uh, the global fishing industry. Nothing else even comes close. And, um, and that's actually quite uh, evident from the uh, World Wildlife Fund report, although it wasn't an explicit headline, but reading between the lines, it's extremely clear and, uh, in their data. And, um, and recognizing that actually uh, um, creates, a, creates an opportunity. Um, why is it, why do I say this? There's a, f Earth has a finite ability to support life. There's a finite amount of land, water, uh, photosynthetic capacity that every living thing on Earth depends on. And, um, and effectively, it's finite, which means that uh, um, they're effectively competing for these resources. And um, the huge uh, um, scale of animal agriculture and fishing uh, is, um, it's so huge that uh, um, it accounts, you know, for, I mean, for example, the animal, the livestock population, it accounts for the majority of um, total biomass, animal biomass on Earth um, at the expense of, it's kind of like a zero-sum game, at the expense of all the other species that depend on those same resources. I'll just give you one illustration of this. Um, the International Livestock Research Institute, which is an NGO, uh, um, very pro-livestock, better lives through livestock is their motto, uh, reported in 2011 that 45 percent of every square meter of land on Earth was actively in use in 2011 for animal agriculture. Okay, That's land that uh, would otherwise be providing uh, habitat for um, wild species. And, um, Okay, so that's identifying the problem. Um, and it's, uh, and beyond just the effect on biodiversity and uh, wildlife, um, these same factors, the use of animals as a technology for food production are huge environmental issues there. The, this uh, animal agriculture is by far the biggest user and consumer, uh, user and polluter of water, according to the uh, UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, and uh, it's a huge contributor to greenhouse gases and global warming. And in fact, the, the biomass losses on the land that's used for animal agriculture um, historically and ongoing uh, represent a huge uh, kind of unaccounted cost because of their lower photosynthetic productivity, meaning less carbon being fixed on those lands, and that doesn't even get counted in it. Um, okay, so, um, and actually among scientists, uh, who study these problems, this is all well recognized. It's not really a, a topic of debate. And yet, here we are at Davos where there's a lot of discussion about big global problems, in, including big environmental problems, and the same was true at COP21. Uh, it virtually, the impact of, of uh, the use of animals for food production on the environment is barely talked about. And in fact, it's kind of ironic uh, um, if, if you do, as I do, want to um, avoid um, uh, supporting that system, 
um, by avoiding animal products in your diet, you could potentially starve to death in Davos. And in Paris, I literally had to walk a mile outside of the conference center to be able to find uh, uh, any food that didn't have meat or fish or dairy in it. So there's this weird disconnect where um, it's a horrible problem. It's kind of recognized by people who are experts, but nobody wants to talk about it and confront it. And why is that? I think it's because um, the foods that we get from animals are, uh, have such uh, uh, importance to billions of people around the world. It's a central part of their daily lives. Um, uh, um, and the pleasure of eating those foods is a big part of the pleasure of living for, again, billions of people. And I would guess probably, if you took a poll, the favorite foods of most of those people are foods that we get from animals. So the sacrifice of giving up those foods uh, is huge. And, um, and it's completely unrealistic to ask people um, to make such a huge sacrifice. You could try, it's not gonna work. Um, but there's a solution to the problem, and, uh, and, and that is that the problem isn't that people love these foods um, and depend on them. The problem is that we're producing them using this ancient, obsolescent technology, namely animals, to convert plant biomass, photosynthetic productivity, into uh, meat and fish and dairy foods. And, um, and that's something that uh, I would say most people just feel like, well, those things are completely inseparable. But actually, if you look at, if you, if you say, we've um, historically used this particular system to produce these foods we love, <coughs> um, is there a better way that's more sustainable but can deliver everything that we value from those foods? And, um, and actually, there is. It's completely feasible. And that's this is where kind of impossible foods uh, uh, comes in. So um, it's possible to produce um, meats uh, and the other foods, but meats that satisfy uncompromising meat lovers, provide the deliciousness, the entire sensory experience that they value, the nutrition they value, the affordability, um, by making those foods directly from plant ingredients. Um, no, cow uh, uh, makes meat from plant ingredients, turns them into meat. It does an abysmal job of it because it didn't evolve for that purpose. Um, there, it's possible to do it another way. And that's the Impossible Foods was founded to develop a, a, a practical, scalable system for doing that. We've been working on it for the past five years. Uh, I won't take you through the whole thing, but we spent a lot of time really trying to get a fundamental understanding of what underlies the properties in these foods that people value so much, the deliciousness, the entire sensory experience, and so forth. It turns out, if you look at it as a scientific problem, there are answers to that question. And uh, once you understand it, you can take um, uh, ingredients from plants directly and produce foods that de deliver that experience. And can you produce foods that really satisfy um, what drives people to buy these foods? Um, uh, yes, you can. And in fact, the evidence is that you know, we now have our first product, which we just launched a few months ago, um, is being served uh, by some of the best chefs and the best restaurants in the world, people who are not just a hardcore, uncompromising uh, chefs who will never compromise on this pleasure of eating with their customers, but they're meat chefs, okay, known for their meat. Uh, and they would not put something bad on the menu. So, Okay, Patrick, so that's fantastic. Um, it sounds like there's a technological solution um, which you've kind of been working on, which is now marketable um, yes. as a sort of viable substitution um, uh, product which has much less of the footprint of any footprint um, and far, far, far lower, far an, eighth, lower. an eighth the greenhouse gas, a quarter the water usage, right. and one twentieth the land requirement. So one twentieth the habitat. So got to ask about the price point. What's that? Is it expensive? Uh, right now, it is um, served in. So you could buy it in New York City a, a burger with fries on the side yeah. <laughs> for I believe uh, twelve ninety nine. 
at one of the best ah. restaurants in New York City, run by David Chang, one of the best wow. uh, known and best chefs. And for that restaurant, I think it's the lowest price thing on the menu. Fabulous. Um, when we're can at I, scale, can I ask a, sorry, yeah. can I ask a, what's the sort of the, the, do you call it a special kind of product? Is it like, what's, what's the name for this m meat variation that you've created? Is it uh, impossible meat? What, what's it called? Yeah, well, we have so far only one product, which yeah. is functionally equivalent to raw ground beef. Right. You can, it's been served by the chefs as tartare. Yeah. It's been cooked at all. Uh, if we want to look it up, what do we look up? We look impossible up. Impossible burger, we call impossible it. Impossible burger. Yes. Okay. And, so and there are a lot of reasons like, why we use like, that term. It sounds like one of these superheroes, you know. The impossible, uh, the impossible burger. Impossible burger. So, so, this, so this is interesting. And many of you have been great. here at the, at, at, at the forum. You've seen this idea of the fourth industrial revolution of you know, new technologies, new innovations that can help to perhaps to accelerate problem solving. Um, it sounds pretty um, exciting that not only is this kind of an, an R&D thing, but it's already being sold in, 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 in restaurants. And the footprint of meat, and as you rightly say, you know, of the, of the livestock industry is, is huge. Yeah. And it's something, again, I think goes back to this awareness raising. Many people don't realize these things. And there was some analysis, 16,000 liters of water to make a kilo of, of, of meat. Marco, if I can come back to you, we've heard, you know, some pretty s impressive innovations from industry on the ground dealing with um, smallholders and livelihoods and some pretty interesting innovations from technology. Uh, given the fact that your, your organization produced such a startling statistic that we'd lost 60% of all wild animals of a backbone in those 42 years, I, I mean, is this offering hope at a speed and scale that is satisfying or, or um, are we still kind of glass half empty on this one, do you think? Um, so let me let me uh, give me an opportunity now to to yeah. spread some hope as well because you know like Kaida said there are plenty of good news as well. They're not systemic, they're not at scale yet, but they're plenty of good news. I mean the media must have um, 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 followed the story of the pandas now not endangered any longer, the tiger numbers going up in the world. I mean, when we want, we can actually make a difference. This is definitely the direction. Um, uh, I, 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 would, uh, I would support completely what, um, um, uh, what has been said just now, um, with the exception that um, uh, beef is definitely one of the top commodities driving uh, uh, nature loss, uh, deforestation as well as uh, biodiversity loss, together with other three, uh, soy, which is actually connected to beef a lot because a lot of what the cattle eat is soya based. Like yeah, and we don't realize how much soy we eat by just eating a chicken uh, and, 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 and beef. Um, the second one is palm oil, and we have to highlight that yeah. because that's a bit different and is still a big driver in many, in many regions of the world. The third one uh, is timber. Um, that continues to be when unsustainably managed. So timber, soy, beef, and palm oil are the yeah, four These are the drivers. four key commodities that are really driving 80% per us of deforestation wow. today. Now the question is, um, technology is an answer. Um, we call it sustainable in the intensification of agriculture. Very often we're using a lot of land, uh, a lot of water, a lot of resources to grow. Uh, Why we could apply the right methods, not necessarily biotechnology, but perhaps biotechnology in some cases can also be helpful. Uh, we could uh, save a lot of land. Together with a good regulation on the, at the local level, uh, this could be really dramatically reduce uh, the footprint. Uh, and, and so basically we are talking about looking at our food system primarily and how we produce food with less, with less land, with less water, uh, with less resources in general. And then the energy dimension, of course. So moving into renewable, moving away from uh, green, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, fossil fuel that produces greenhouse gases, the global warming, that's the second side of the story. So, I have to say, we're moving in that direction. I mean, here in Davos, we were together, actually, with Dominique at a meeting uh, with big businesses um, embracing sustainable commodities, commodities produced in a sustainable way, smart way. Um, uh, the movement is there. Uh, acceleration is what we need to see, uh, and that's where we need to work together. Okay. So let's um, um, thank you, um, panelists. Um, let's see if there's any questions or comments from our audience here to any of the panelists on any of these topics. Please. And remind us who you are so that the people watching at home can know who you are. Um, hi, my name is Faiza Nakvi. I'm uh, from Aman Foundation in Pakistan. We focus on healthcare and education. So uh, you actually answered some of the questions that I had been writing down earlier, which was uh, what is the biggest contributing factor you know, towards extinction? But I wanted to know that what are the factors that you feel we can easily mobilize? Because 
a lot of these things take time. Yeah. So what is it that one can kind of tell people that, okay, if this is what you do, it's going to have this impact and have that exponential impact? Uh, and then there was one other question, and uh, that was really more about, let's say, natural paper and, uh, let, you know, because a lot of timber is used for paper and, and pulp and things. So if you're going to be using um, man-made materials instead, what's going to be the effect uh, of those um, in terms of being able to recycle and the effect on, you know, on the world okay. from that? Thank any you. other, let's take a look, if there's any other question before we go back to the panel. Any other comments from the floor? One over here. I think you've laid out a really exciting case of how biodiversity conservation and slowing a sixth extinction can often be very profitable. Win-win, as, as Dominic referred to it. What do we do in situations where, and, and perhaps they're rare, what do we do in situations where slowing a sixth extinction or uh, preserving biodiversity is unprofitable, and perhaps a view of how common those situations are that we may face. And remind us who you are. Apologies. Doug McCauley, I'm a professor at University of California, Santa Barbara. OK, so um, kind of rapid, any thoughts from our panel on the with three things, kind of where can we kind of inspire people to get involved in the movement? So there's a very, I understand what I'm doing, and I can understand the outcome on this. Um, perhaps on the substitution, side, you know, if we move into other materials, uh, does that have a, other impacts further downstream and recycling and such? Um, and what about when there isn't a win-win, as, as Pat has, has set out, where it, we just can't find that um, economic kind of uh, 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 case for the, for the challenge? Um, maybe if we start with you, Pat, if that's okay, and kind of work that way? Uh, sure. Um, you can pick any or all of those topics. If we're well, practicing. I think that, that uh, one of the, uh, the first questions was, um, uh, you know, uh, these so-called technology-based solutions will take a long time. But actually, uh, I'll just say, you know, at Impossible Foods, we're um, building a plan where we have every intention, and we're committed to it, to um, scale to the point where we can replace the majority of the food that comes from animals with food that's produced by the um, uh, technology that we've developed. It's fundamentally feasible. And, um, and the strategy that we're using uh, uh, for it to work, it has to be market-based. We, we have to deliver something that consumers prefer to the products that they get from the incumbent industries um, or we won't, you know, we won't achieve our mission. Uh, but it's completely, it, that, it's clear that it's completely doable and because the fundamental economics are so much better. If you're more resource efficient, you're more dollar efficient. And because uh, all those resources have a, have a, have a cost associated with so them. What are your scale targets? What are you? What are, I mean, in the next five years, what are your aspirations for growth on this? Well, uh, the simple answer is um, as fast as possible. Wonderful. And um, and we are, um, you know, internally. I mean, we'd like to have. We're we're starting with with one product. We have a bunch of others in the pipeline, and we'd like to have uh, be approaching a double-digit fraction of the U.S. market wow. within five years. Wow. Um, it requires a lot of scaling because, unfortunately, well, I should, you know, unfortunately for the environment, but uh, Americans consume an un un unbelievable amount of meat. Just the amount of ground beef consumed alone is 10 billion pounds a year in the U.S. So it's a scaling issue, right. but it's completely doable. And um, uh, I think that uh, it would be great if there were um, non- uh, um, sort of market-based solutions to the problem that were realistic. But I think on the time scale that we need to solve this problem, yeah. uh, um, the only thing that can work fast enough is to leverage the power of the free market, basically, by making a product that consumers prefer. Got it. Well, we wish Impossible Foods all the very best. Like That sounds like a fabulous kind of innovation. Um, Ada, uh, to any or all of those questions that you heard, any thoughts? Well, we can prevent extinction of species by providing them the ecosystem and habitat to live in. So the quickest way to actually make things happen very quickly is basically to en encourage as many companies and, and uh, countries as possible to adopt zero deforestation policy. That's one thing that uh, I would like to stress. And of course, the uh, companies uh, should implement 
recycling or so circular economy. That's basically the basis of what my company uh, uh, is, is implementing their uh, sustainability policy, zero deforestation, SDGs, landscape approach, circular economy. That's the basis and the metrics where we uh, measure ourselves against. And um, uh, recycling products, that's one thing. Yes, we produce recycled products, and, and, uh, but, uh, but the recycled products can only process uh, fiber for, pulp for five times and cannot do more than that. So we, st we do still need virgin fiber for pulp protection. But the key is we have to make sure that the virgin fiber that we, we use for our pulp and paper production must come from zero deforestation uh, sources and responsibly manage. I think that's very key. Ada, thank you very much, and um, thank you for the leadership that you're showing um, in the paper and pulp industry in Indonesia. Marco, you kicked us off with some rather startling <laughs> statistics. You. you provoked quite an interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've heard from industry innovation and technological innovation to the marketplace. The last word is yours. So. Thank you. Um, on your question about what can we do, basically, um, I mean, obviously, it depends very much on, on, on the country and the circumstances. But broadly speaking, two things. In our daily life, we can already do a lot. Um, based on what we eat, what we choose to eat, um, based on how we choose um, to uh, use the energy to power our life. Uh, there are so many behaviors um, to avoid waste and to choose the right things, sustainably grown or uh, renewable energy when available, and of course it's increasingly available. Um, so a lot of stuff that we can do individually. Food, energy, I would say, and the last one is finances. Even our little deposits. Let's make sure that they are not invested into things that damage the environment. We can talk to our asset managers and say, I want my money to be invested in green activities, not in activities that I don't agree with. Three dimensions there. Then on your interesting question, um, it's a tricky one, but uh, I, I would say it's difficult to answer to the general question you posed. It's, it's more a question of perspective and time frame. I'll give you an example. If you are a, a grower of palm oil, uh, conserving orangutans uh, in Indonesia or in Borneo, it's a problem. <laughs> it's not a profitable um, a proposition. Um, but like it happen it's happening now in Sabah, Malaysia, where the tourism industry is so strong and based on forest experience, tropical rainforest experience. And there is a, such a strong uh, sector now based in Malaysia, Sabah in particular, where the government, by the way, has invested a lot. They are now beginning to see that conservation of Bhutan is super profitable, and they're beginning to be a force of opposition towards further, uh, against further clearing. So it's not a question of perspective time frame. Um, and, uh, but I think the time frame is quite interesting because increasingly uh, we are beginning to realize the profitability of nature conservation. And that's, uh, for some sectors particularly, is quite now beginning to be a strong, uh, strong dimension. Wonderful. So thank you very much to our panel and thank you for uh, listening both here in Davos and uh, across the internet. That was a brief introduction to the scale of the challenge of the sixth great extinction and some pretty interesting innovations from across civil society business and new arrivals in the, um, um, I want to say kind of food industry if I may, because um, it sounds like this could be fascinating if we get to double digit growth in the US a market for Impossible Foods. So to Asia Paper and Pulp, WWF and Impossible Foods, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.